What is up, everybody? Mr. Pertis here. Welcome to the last and final piece of 614.50. I call this the wrap up because there's a lot of things that we talked about in this unit that didn't really piece all together nice and neat. We pulled things apart. Like I said in the first video, we're going to piece everything back together here. And a couple things that are on the periphery or the outside of what we've talked about, and they don't really fit into some of the other stuff. So we're going to just put a whole bunch of mishmash put together type stuff. And hopefully by the time we get done with this, everything will make sense uh, and it'll all kind of come together. So the first thing that we need to look at is there's a migration of peoples during this time period. And by migration of people, I mean people who are going to be in one specific location and then they are going to spread out. And one group that is going to spread out is located here in Central Africa. This is the Bantus. The Bantus are a group of people who have highly advanced metallurgical skills, metallurgical skills, which we've used that word in class before. It's basically just the idea of taking metals and melting them down and using them to your advantage. And one thing they had was iron metallurgy. They use this iron metallurgy here in Central Africa to farm. So they would make um, iron tools, specifically something that or sword almost to chop down trees. And they would use what was called slash and burn agriculture. They would set the whole forest on fire um, and left behind would be ashes. And in that ash is extremely fertile soil. And that fertile soil allows them to grow. The problem with this fertile soil is that it only is fertile for a season or two. And after that, you need to migrate in order to find more fertile soil. So this group of Bantu people are going to migrate over a thousand year period through most of kind of sub-Saharan Africa here. And the Bantu migration is going to lead to the spread of these metallurgical skills as well as environmental issues because they're slashing and burning as they go. Also, they're going to spread their language. And a lot of the languages in this region of sub-Saharan Africa have similar linguistic characteristics. Uh, so there are many are of Bantu origin, uh, not that everyone in these regions can understand each other, but the language is similar. Also, we have a group of people who are called the Polynesians. Um, they are going to migrate from Polynesia and they're really going to focus. They're going to migrate throughout this region here, this triangle. Um, and you can kind of see the migration spreading out. Pretty amazing that we're talking a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, when these Polynesian peoples are going to migrate out to these different islands with very limited map making and navigational skills. But they're going to spread out. Um, they are also going to spread their language. So a lot of people in this area right here are going to speak a similar dialect called of Polynesian languages. So two, two different people who are going to migrate in terms of trade routes and things that we talked about, these uh, existing trade routes, things that the trade routes that existed during the past time period of 600 BCE to 600 CE. So we have the Silk Road, the Indian Ocean trade, the Sub-Saharan African trade, the Mediterranean Sea trade are going to continue to flourish during this time period. Along these trade routes, we're going to see cities that grow. And two areas I just want to point out that didn't come up specifically in a lot of stuff we talked about, but was in readings is one, by the end of this time period, we're going to see the beginnings and the flourishing of the Italian city-states. So the Italian city-states, after the Crusades are over, um, they're really going to start working and dominating in the Mediterranean Sea trade. And a lot of Italian merchants are going to get wealthy, which is going to lead to, in the next time period, a period called the Renaissance. So a little synthesis there. Also, as a result of the Indian Ocean trade and the spread of Islamic merchant activity in this region, there's going to be what are called the Swahili city-states here on the east coast of Africa, which combines that Bantu language, the Bantu migrations, along with Arabic. So there's going to be an in Islamic influence here as well in East Africa. Um, also, you see Timbuktu in West Africa. We have uh, Calcutta, which is here. We're going to have um, Shang'an, Baghdad, uh, up here, the Russian city-states. So a lot of these areas that we've talked about with the different empires, um, and of course, Constantinople right here are going to flourish. Also, we're going to, in order to expand on this, we have some new luxury goods um, or innovations that are going to allow for the growth of luxury goods. Two things, both of which um, are really have a lot of Chinese and Arabic influence, the idea of southernization. One is the compass. Another is the astrolabe, which allows you to tell latitude um, and longitude based on where the horizon is. So you can kind of know the direction that you're going, which allows for exploration and allows for more trade, especially along the Indian Ocean trade route. And obviously a lot of these ideas are going to spread to Western Europe as a result of opening up trade. Also the um, caravan Sarai, these are big fancy word. Um, it is the merchants who are going to travel along the Silk Road trade, especially in the Persian area and the Middle East, um, whether they're on camels, whether they are on other type of pack animals, they're going to be areas 
basically day-to-day -day stops along these trade routes. So along these trade routes, whether it's the Silk Road, whether it is like the southern part of the Silk Road going in through um, Baghdad and into Mesopotamia, there's going to be areas to stop along the way. Basically like daily pit stops where there's almost these little trade cities that are going to allow merchants to stop, exchange goods, talk to other people, and kind of rest after a day of traveling. From all of this, this increase in trade, we have an increase of luxury goods. Don't forget, these are not just basic products that are being traded. These are products for the upper class individuals. So we're going to see luxury goods, whether it's cotton textiles. That just means this is the cotton textiles right here. Um, silk, spices, obviously. And these are going to be traded throughout the Afro-Eurasian trade area, specifically going to be used by upper class and upper middle class individuals throughout these regions. Also, we're going to have the diffusion of uh, or the spread of crops, sugar, and cotton. Um, you really need tropical climates for this to grow. So you're going to see it mainly in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and then a little bit in the Middle East. Um, for example, Western European, you can't grow sugar and cotton. The temperature doesn't work. Just like uh, here in New York, in the New York metro area, you can't grow these things. So if you want access to them, you need areas that have the that have the tropical climate to do this, which is going to be beneficial when the Western Europeans conquered the Americas, that synthesis. Also, we're gonna have explorers who are gonna use these trade routes. And you've, we've talked about both of these individuals, um, so I don't really wanna go too much in depth, but we have Ivan Batuta, who is from, um, really from the Islamic empire. He is gonna travel to 44 countries, modern day countries, and 73,000 miles. That is crazy, 73,000 miles. Um, so this is the area that he, um, travels to as we talked about in class with him he is unfamiliar with this area in west africa and he's appalled by the rights that women have and the lack of patriarchy and strong um, male dominated society when he goes to west africa and a lot of this just shows how these explorers don't fully grasp where they're going and what the cultural understanding is of the time and also we have marco polo marco polo who is a, a merchant from the italian city states is going to travel and write about his accounts in his book, uh, The Travels of Marco Polo, and he's gonna travel all the way along the Silk Road trade and down the Indian Ocean trade. He's gonna hang out for a while in the Mongol Empire and uh, be part of the court of Kublai Khan. Also, we have the spread of religions. Uh, Buddhism is gonna continue to spread, uh, with, especially into Asia. We're gonna have Christianity is gonna continue to spread, obviously into Russia, coming back to the Russian city-states with the um, the Cyrillic alphabet from the Byzantine Empire and the spread of missionary activity. Islam is an obvious one, uh, which is, if you don't know that, we got a big problem in this unit. And lastly, is Neo-Confucianism is going to spread throughout the Tang Dynasty as that reaction to Buddhism. So just to keep in mind, this happened in the last time period. It's going to happen in this time period. It's going to happen in the next time period. It's going to happen in the time period after that. We constantly see the spread of religion. And as religion spreads, it changes based on where it's going. So we're going to adapt to the areas that we are. Also, we're going to see populations kind of go up and fall. Um, obviously, when they fall, um, keep in mind, this is a thousand year, almost a thousand year period. So cities are going to rise and fall depending upon what's going on. We have invasions, um, diseases. And if you want to kind of read more about this and just get a good overview of stuff we've talked about, just so you can see it, feel free to pause this. But just a quick thing, decline in agriculture. Also, we're going to see this little ice age that's going to happen around 1300, uh, which is kind of a cooling of the Earth's atmosphere um, and the Earth's temperature, which is going to lead to some agricultural issues and a decrease in uh, popular or food as well as population, um, which is also part with the Black Death. And then we all have other cities that are going to thrive depending upon where you are, your location, how whether you avoid invasions after invasions end. Um, safe transportation is going to lead to increase in cities, which is connects back to the Mongols. Um, rise in trade and temperature, more farms, more people is more labor, more labor is more food, more food is more people, and the cycle goes on and on and on. Last but not least, patriarchy is going to continue in most areas. And we've talked in a great detail about the patriarchal systems that are going on through most of these empires. There are a few exceptions to this. First is in West Africa. Obviously, I put this picture up here because women are allowed to work in the marketplace. Women have more freedom, even though it's a Muslim society where women can interact with men that aren't their husbands, which is a positive. It shows more rights for women. Also in Japan, upper class women in Japan during this shogun period and this feudal period up until the Tokugawa shogunate, which is in the next time period, do have the ability to get educated. And upper class women are encouraged to get educated and encouraged to pursue artistic endeavors and writing endeavors. And this book is called uh, The Pillow Book, 
of Shea Shonagon, which is horrible Japanese pronunciation. But uh, the pillow book is about her experiences in the Japanese court and kind of the things that she saw as she was in court and the secrets that she heard about. And this is one of the more popular books in Japan at the time. Last but not least, Mongol women. Mongol women were treated virtually equal to men. They were allowed to hunt. They were allowed to ride. They were allowed to take care of the home while their husbands were off creating this huge empire. So they are treated very equally. They're allowed household finances. A lot of good things if you're a Mongol woman, which makes sense because the Mongols are nomadic. And if you are nomadic, you don't have that Neolithic Revolution influence of farming to bring down uh, women's roles. So that's a huge piece. That is what I got for the wrap up. If you have any questions, as always, write it down, ask, hopefully you took notes. And this kind of provides the wrap up, which will lead us into the next time period, which is 17, 1450 to 1750. That's all I got. Have a good day.